On the Sunday following his inauguration, the very next day, the president took his problem to the great counselor. He went to church and bowed his head in prayer as he'd done on the morning of March 4th before proceeding to the Capitol to take the oath. And while we cannot know what Franklin D. Roosevelt confided to his God or asked of his God, we do know that the people felt an even greater reassurance in this simple act of devotion on the part of the man who had so thrilled and uplifted him. And then, without the loss of an hour, he called in his secretary of the treasury, William H. Wooden, and planned and executed those brilliant and decisive strokes by which the country's financial structure was preserved. By declaring a bank holiday, he halted the growing penny and provided a breathing spell in which to readjust credit and provide more currency. March the 9th was a notable day in our history, with Congress eagerly accepting the President's recommendation. By a vote of 73 to 7, the United States Senate hastened to pass the President's banking measure. It was the most emphatic vote of confidence which that body had given to the head of the nation in many a long year. In the House, the new Speaker, white-haired Henry W. Rainey of Illinois, was at the throttle and running the legislative locomotive in the direction of his party leader, the President, was demanding it should go. Rainey knew it was no time for quibbling. Straight through, he drove the Roosevelt measure. Intense interest was shown in the House as the clerk read the President's great economy bill, which planned the saving of 500 million. And with the banking situation smoothing out, the President went on the air on the night of Sunday, March the 12th, and talked to the people in simple, friendly terms. The bank holiday, while resulting in many cases in great inconvenience, is affording us the opportunity to supply the currency necessary to meet the situation. No sound bank is a dollar worse off than it was when it closed its doors. It is possible, of course, in a very few places that when the banks resume, a very few people who have not recovered from their fear may again begin withdrawals. Let me make it clear that the banks will take care of all needs. And it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime. After all, there is an element in the readjustment of our financial system that is more important than currency, more important than gold, and that is the confidence of the people themselves. Confidence and courage are the essentials of success in carrying out our plan. You people must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite in banishing fear. We have provided the machinery to restore our financial system, and it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friends, no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. An entirely new spirit came over the face of the government under the president's guidance. For the first time in history, the Treasury Department, under orders from Secretary Wooden, permitted pictures to be made of the processes of printing and engraving United States currency in the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington. Why, it made the old-timers gasp they were so startled. Confident in their president, in his policies, people all over the country rushed back to replace the deposits as the closed banks reopened their doors. All over the land, business and trading felt the impetus of this new confidence and courage. The wheels began to turn again. There was a rush of trading in the great Chicago wheat pit. In the New York stock market, prices rose sharply. People began to buy it, and encouraging reports were heard on all sides about the upturn in business that had come at last. A memorable day, when at the president's behest, the Senate, in record time, voted for beer and the end of the long drought was in sight. Elated but resolute, the president sat at his desk, 
facing one new problem after another. With the financial structure of the country strengthened and revitalized, with new impetus given to commerce and industry, his mind now turned to farmers in their place, to the crop farmers who raise our vegetables, and to the big grain farmers who provide our bread. And his thoughts took in also the distressing situation of the sheep raisers of the West. And as to what could be done soundly and practically for those men whose flocks cover a thousand hills, a wealth of wool and of mutton, and no market worth the trouble of shipping. And as our president sat and thought at his desk, he visioned the troubles of the Western cattlemen, sons and descendants of the bold spirits who carved out the famous cattle trails of the Old West. And in his mind's eye, no doubt, he could see the great and useless herds of fine beef, for which also there was no price to bring joy to the heart of the cowman. Days passed swiftly in that historic month of March 1933 when so much was done and so much was planned. And this man of many burdens gave his whole mind and soul to pondering the swift and practical things. And to him came the great vision of relieving unemployment by a great reforestation project, embracing 10 states to provide work for 250,000 men and to create new farms, new towns, new wealth for the people as a whole clearing and reinvigorating the forests of the land. Providing the building material which industry needed. Visioning the progress of timber from the new forests that are to arise to the mills of industry that will await them in the future. Forests that will not be robbed by haste and by greed. His rapid mind moved on to the 22nd of that historic march to another decisive stroke. At his desk in the White House, he signed the bill which kept one of the most important pledges of the Democratic platform, the pledge to give beer back to the people if the democracy came into power. There it was, the document which reversed the ironclad restrictions of 13 years. And immediately all over the country, the work of preparing to brew good beer was begun. The cobwebs of years of neglect were swept from backs. Armies of men were called to polish the brewing machinery, to put the long neglected plants in perfect order for the rush of business that was certain to come. Another impetus was given to business when the president put his name to the beer bill and made it law. they brushed up the brewery horses. And even the horses felt the gay stimulus of the New Deal. And Broadway got lit up to celebrate. has had anything to do with it. Something fine has occurred in this great country. You can actually see people going to work. Factories which have been closed for months, for years in some cases, have called for men, have started the wheels to turning, and are resuming the long interrupted routine of production. America is catching its full stride. There is a new feeling of hope, of determination in the air. It is a new march of prosperity behind the country's militant leaders the fighting president.